So I want to tell you a story about Frank Mink. And uh, last night, you know, I had the privilege of going down and picking up down at 30th Street Station. And Frank and I were, were driving back and, and uh, just were having this wonderful conversation. He shared with me this story. I asked him who his favorite speaker was, and he said he got, to, got a chance to actually share the stage and speak with Desmond Tutu, who's a Nobel Prize winner. And, and in a conversation with, with uh, Archbishop Tutu, uh, you know, Tutu looks at Frank and he goes, Frank, stop looking for God out there. And he points right at Frank's chest. And he says, find God in here. And that's so much what this story is about, is finding God in here, finding that resonance in our hearts, our heart song, the image and likeness that we are born into that allows God to flow through us, out into the world, out there to make a difference. So with that, very honored, very, very honored to introduce our speaker for today, Frank Mink. morning. So uh, <clears throat> I'm actually born and raised in Philadelphia. I'm actually a Philadelphian. I don't live here any longer and, uh, and I travel all, kind of all over the world, but I always bring that, that Philly swagger that I was born with, you know. <laughs> we are no bullcrap type people and we talk so fast that where I live now, nobody understands a word I say, you know. Like, how about that? They're like, what did you say? I said, how about that? They don't get it, right? And as we're in, I'm in the same country, and they don't understand what I'm talking about. When you go to the Midwest, people talk, and I swear it takes them 10 minutes to say what us on the East Coast can say in two minutes, you know? You see that? Yeah, I see that. It was about that. Yep, it was good. You know, cool. Then it takes forever to talk about the corn, right? So, so look, this world is different, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, and I happen to... Uh, be blessed that I have become a student of the world. But being born and raised in South Philly, I was born and raised very Irish Catholic. Some of you might know, you know, I'm from down Second Street, Mummers, my whole family, Mummers, you know, and um, made all my sacraments. So I was in the gang. I was in the Catholic gang, so I made all my sacraments. And, and I love Catholicism, and I don't knock Catholicism. I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> like, I don't do that because I think Catholicism had its part in my life, and it was good. But I was also born with that grandmother, and I don't know if you were born with this grandmother. We might have had the same grandma. But if I stub my toe and I cry to my grandma and say, I stub my toe, she say, well, God punished you. I said, but I didn't do anything. I stubbed my toe. She says, he knows you're going to do something. So I always had that God that was like going to just, you know, crush me for something, for a bad credit score that I didn't even score yet. So I was born with that God. But look, I still love that I was part of it. And I made my sacraments and my mom and everyone in our family is named after a priest. But here's the funny thing. When my mom left my father, my father was from Southwest Philly. My father was and this guy who was in this little Rocky Balboa at Dego. You know, that was my dad. And my mom was an Irish girl who rebelled from her family back in the day. And the rebel back in the day was she went and she met Rocky Balboa. And that was my dad. So my dad was this guy who was in illegal dealings and fit all the great stereotypes that they had back then, you know. He'd do wop on the corner, drinking Dago red wine. And my dad uh, was not in my part of my life. So my mom moves to, back to her Irish neighborhood. I am with her in tow. So she brings this little Dago kid. So I had his last name when I first got down there. And then I went to the local Catholic school, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and I had Sister Mary Agnes was my teacher, and um, I remember mid-season I heard I get to change my last name. For some reason, somehow, my last name had to go back to my mom's maiden name, which was Mink. And see, everyone would say, well, it's safe for him because he lives in this Irish neighborhood. He don't want to have a Dago last name living in an Irish neighborhood. Now, Mink is even Irish, but as long as I wasn't Italian, <laughs> I was cool in that neighborhood, right? So look, um, I have identity crisis right off the bat. I don't even know what my last name is. So 
as I started to get along, me and my mom, you know, I, we were one of the families that you hear about. I, we were on uh, public assistance on welfare at times. You know, nowadays, if you're on public assistance, they give you a little card, a little green card, public access card. Back in the day, and some of you might remember this, they didn't give us a card. They gave us a booklet of neon-colored money that screamed, look at me, I'm the poor kid. Right? Every time you had to pull out food stamps in front of somebody. So I remember I go to the store, and in South Philly, some of you know, and even in Southwest when I was up by my dad's, but the corner deli is everything. So you'd have to go to the corner deli with these food stamps. And who comes in the corner deli right out behind you when you're about to pay with food stamps? The hottest girl in my neighborhood. <laughs> you don't pull out food stamps in front of hot girls, so you let everyone go first in the whole store. Shivery ain't dead when you're poor. Oh, you first. No, 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 no. I, you, please, you know. So, problems, I got problems. <clears throat> my mom gets remarried to a guy who is not a good human being. And I can still say this, and I, and I am not, I'm not the only one that's judged, you know. I mean, everyone in our family eventually turned on to the fact that this was not a good human being, and he did not like me as a kid. He did not like that I was a, an Italian. He would have all these things to say to me all the time, and he started to eventually hit me, beat me, punish me, and it was crazy. I had never been through this as a 11, 12, 10, 11, 12 year old kid. So now I'm always getting grounded. So when I would get grounded, I would go to school in my local neighborhood, you know, I went to public school, and I, when I was grounded, that was the only time I got to be my friend, so I started to show off at school, and I'm getting in trouble. And real quick, and some of you will know this, because when I tell this story in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, they don't get this. But my school was a mixed Philadelphia public school. We were, it was Chargewood Elementary, right? We went from pre-kindergarten to eighth grade in the same building, and we were very racially diverse. We were Irish, Italian, black, and Puerto Rican. A little bit of Asian mixed in, but mostly those four groups. And it was a mixed group, but I was one of the tougher, oldest Irish kids. So whenever I would get in trouble, see, if you were an Irish kid, they would send you right home. If you were any other race of child, they would keep you at school all day because they didn't want you walking through the Irish neighborhood all by yourself. That's how we were. So every day when I would get in trouble, they would kick me out because, see, in that Irish neighborhood, if I was walking outside of school during school hours, somebody would call my family because we're all related. <laughs> we're all cousins, you know what I mean? So someone would call my grandmom and say, what the heck, you know? Like, I just seen Frank walking outside of school at school hours. They're straight ratting me out, you know? And we, are, we were all related because I would get home, and I remember telling my grandmom this. I would go to my grandmom and I'd say, Grandmom, I love Susie Q. And she'd say, Susie Q from 4th Street? i say, yeah, Susie Q from 4th Street. She'd go, that's your cousin from the, fourth cousin from the boat, you incest son of a gun. Don't touch her, you know? <laughs> so we're all related. Fourth cousin. But anyway, I would go home, and my stepfather would wait for me sometimes, and i get home one day, and I got in trouble. And as I'm going home, and now this is where you might not get my story, but other people do, especially when I do this talk at juvenile detention centers. My goal every day, my goal, my dream, is I wanted to get hit by a car. Because if I got hit by a car on 4th Street before I got home, I can go to a hospital and not go home for the day. Because I knew in South Philly, everyone gets hit by a car. It's a thing to do. You know what I mean? It's always your cousins that run you over. So I would go out, and hopefully I'd get run over, and I would just go to the hospital for the day. I didn't want to go home with my stepfather in my house. So every day I would go out to get hit by a car. I'll explain real quick backstory. I have um, these legs that are, um, I hope this isn't a bad, I have very unsexy legs. Like, I have very bow-legged. They got muscles that hang off them. They always did. I look like a freak, right? For muscles. So, but I'm unbelievably fast, always faster than all the older kids in my neighborhood. I was just a fast, fast kid. So whenever that car would come to hit me, I do this thing, and we all have it. If you're not crazy, we all have it. It's called self-preservation. It would say, don't hurt yourself. And here's the proof fact that we all have it. If you bite into your arm right now, all of us in this room, don't do it now, do it later. Bite into your arm and try and bite as hard as you possibly can and see if you can bite a hole. You can't. Your brain says, hey, you're biting as hard as you can. Knock it off. But if you grab somebody else and bit them with the same strength power that you think you're biting yourself with, you'll bite a hole right through your arm. It's self-preservation. So anytime that car would come to get me, and it was just about to hit me, and I'd pick like a Yugo, like a small car, you know, something that's not going to hurt too much. So I see that car coming, and as it's about to hit me, every time, oh, sorry, I really did just hurt myself. Um, 
I got a tour, a tour in PCO, and I just did that, and I shouldn't have did that. Anyway, so I get out of the way, and as the car would come by, um, I would think, you loser. <laughs> you absolute loser. You can't even get hit by a car. I mean, that's, that's how I'm thinking is my thought process. And I go home, and I get whooped. And finally, uh, I get to go back, and I go live up in my dad's neighborhood because my stepfather kicks me out of my mom's house, and I'm 13 years old, and I go live up in my dad's neighborhood. Some of you guys might know Southwest Philadelphia. My dad's from 70th or 70th Street. He's a 68th and Buellist guy. My, we grew up on 70th and Woodland, so it's almost an all-black neighborhood. And I go to this all-black school called Pepper Middle School. It's like on 87th Street, 86th Street. It's out by the airport, right? And I go to this school, and when I used to go to the school, all the white kids, we all go together. So all the white kids, we get together, and what we used to do is we'd all stand there at the train stop after or the trolley, when the trolley drop us off, the 11th and the 36th trolley, and as soon as uh, all the white boys would show up together, we just do this. All right. I'm Mark Senko, and we all run the school, and that's how we got to school every day. And we could run through the housing projects to get to school. And school wasn't much better when we would get in a fight with all the black kids. Even if you would stand up and you had the better of the fight, you're going to get sucker punched from the side. And then once you get sucker punched from the side, you see the teachers coming. And you say, oh, cool, here come the teachers. And here goes what the teachers would do. I would have three or four black kids on me. I'd have one kid under me. And the teacher come out and he'd break it up. He'd say, come on, get off the white boy. Get, get, get off the white boy. Get off. Okay, see you later. And you're standing there with all these dudes. I was just fist fighting. I mean, like, standing right there, like, you're not going to help me here, you know? See you guys. Get off the white boy. And that's how our school was. It totally sucked. It was a horrible school to go to. It was a very violent school, and I hated it. And I played softball there. Now, I'm a little skateboarder kid at this time. I'm starting to become a skateboarder. A little punk rock kid, you know? I thought I was cool. So I, sometimes that saved me at the school because sometimes some of the black kids thought I was like devil boy because I had like the teardrop haircut and ripped up clothes. And sometimes that saved me. Other times it didn't. Well, I become the captain of the softball team at Pepper. And I'm the only white kid on the team, let alone I'm the skater. And uh, I, I'm, you know, making some friends. But I went into the bathroom one day. And as I walked into the bathroom at Pepper Middle School, that was like the bad thing. If you were a boy, we had a rule, you're like, you just don't drop a deuce at school, right? You just don't do that. So you wait till after school when no one's around. So I'm going up in there after school, and as I walk up in there, I see these four, you know, there's three black kids. There was four kids, one was a white kid. But I see these three black kids come out on me. And the one kid I went to uh, math class, I was real cool with him. We had softball together, I knew him. He's kind of a bigger kid too. He comes walking out on me, and I see these two other kids. Now, real quick, they were jumping the white kid in the stall. And when they came out, the smaller black kid, and we all know this guy in our lives, no matter what color, race, creed you are, we all know this type of guy in our life. He was one of these ones, I'm crazy. He always had to tell everyone how crazy he was all the time until he got knocked out, you know, or until he ran and left you while you were getting jumped, you know, that crazy guy you got, you know. He was fake crazy. So... He comes out on me, too, and uh, I said, oh, here we go. And Steve, the bigger black kid, said, nah, I'm cool with Frank. You go ahead, Frank, you're cool, right? I mean, I'm not going to rat on them for robbing and beating this white kid in the stall. And I said, yeah, I'm cool. And as I walked out of that, that, that bathroom, man, I like, wouldn't take my eyes off them. And I backed out, and I ran home, and I never went back to school again. I was done with that school. That summer, I went up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where my cousins lived. They were South Philly people originally. Now, when I went up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, that was crazy to me. Right? On this road of four miles long, there's like four families. And the only family that was normal was my South Philly family. All the rest of them were Amish people. I mean, that's crazy to me. That's, you know, they turn butter. They ride around on horse and buggies, and they don't do it as a reenactment like down in Williamsburg. This is really how they live. Are you kidding me? They're so nice. They wave to everybody. Hi. Hey. National Geographics. So um, my cousin was this older skateboarder kid. I thought he was super cool, you know. And so I couldn't wait for him to get home. I got to his house before he got home. I forget where he was. So he, I go up in his room. He used to be a punk rocker. You know, he had anarchy signs and spit on the walls and you know what I mean just punk rock well 
he, I walk in his room and he, I notice he had a sliding balcony door. My aunt and uncle had some money, and that's why I went out a little balcony to the room. Well, his balcony doors had two sliding glass doors. One was a swastika flag, and the other was a Confederate flag. So that kind of tweaks my interest. I kind of know a little bit about that stuff. I'm 14 years old. He had new wallpaper to his, ar- to his wall, newspaper articles about skinheads. And then my cousin comes walking in. He's shaved bald. He's got these nicely cropped pants on. And, you know, he's got these boots on with these white laces in them. And he comes walking in, and we started talking, and he starts explaining that he's a skinhead. Well, every night, these other skinheads would come over to my cousin's house, and they would all park their car in the Amish guy's field because they're sleeping at night, you know? So they all park their cars, and then they all come climb up the balcony, and they bring beer with them. Sometimes they brought girls over. They're like 16-, 17-year-old guys. They got tattoos. They're totally cool to me. And what they used to do is when we'd all sit around, and I'm not telling you these guys were that methodic that they knew how to recruit me, but what they would do is they'd sit around and they would talk to me, and my cousin would say to them, hey, my little cousin here, man, he's growing up right now in Southwest Philly. He's like, it's even tougher than South Philly. He's like, it's crazy down there. He goes to school with all black people. He's like, tell these guys about it, Frank. And all these older skinheads would be like, yeah, what's it like down in Philly? You know, to them, Philly's like the mystical city. You know what I mean? Like, they could hate black people all they want, and they could say the N-word all they want because they're around Amish people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the man, when they would think, I really went to school with black people. And I said, yeah, I went to school with black people. See, so, and when they would start to ask me this stuff, and I'm not giving any of you a sob story about my life. I'm, I, just, it is what it is, and I'm telling you right now, to this day, my parents are still the same way. My parents never asked me when I got home from school, when I come in from the door, how's school today, son? How's that Susie Q girl you like? How's math class? Like, they just didn't do that stuff to me. They still don't. I can call my parents right now. They still won't ask me how my day's going. They're just, they're just not them type of parents. When these guys would ask me, yo, what's it like going to school? To me, it was them saying, how's your day, Frank? How's your day? And I'd say, it sucks. <laughs> Everything sucks. My life sucks. Everything sucks. School sucks. My parents suck. So now we go to this concert one night, and we're right in downtown Lancaster. And as we're going, I'm still got this little skater haircut. And as we get this little skater haircut, and we go into this nightclub, and the band starts playing, and there starts this little mosh pit. And all the skinheads are going to go in, and they're going to go beat up everybody. That was their job. There was 40 or some odd skinheads, maybe 25, 30, I forget how many, but there was a lot of them, and I'm with them. And they're going to go in, and this is 1989, so they're going to go beat up other white people. And they're going to go beat up other white people who have... There was another haircut that was really big at the time called the mullet. And they're going to go beat people up with mullets, and rightfully so, right? (laughs) So they get in there, and they start fighting with everybody, and this bigger skinhead puts me on his shoulders. And now I still got the little skater haircut, and I'm with this big farm boy skinhead, and he's grabbing people, and he goes, kick them, Frank. And I'm trying to kick at these people in the mosh pit, and it's not really working, but I'm trying just to be cool with these guys. And the bouncers came, and they kicked us out. And they kicked all the skinheads out all night long. And now I'm one of the first people that got kicked out with the skinheads. So I'm standing with them outside the nightclub. We're all against the wall together. And I'm with them. And then this guy that we were trying to beat up comes walking out. And that big farm boy, and I was like the biggest guy with us that night, our crew. He says, come on, Frank, let's go. And we walk over to that guy, this guy who's kind of a bigger guy too, the guy with the mullet. Who's walking by and he walks over to him. And this big skinhead goes, yo, dude, you got something to say to us? Pointing to me. So he's like, you got something to say to me and him? You know? And I'm looking at this guy with the mullet, waiting to see if he's going to say anything. And he was like, no, I had nothing to say from you from the get-go. You just started beating me up. And I seen this look, and I seen it for the first time, really. Fear. He feared us. No, he really didn't fear me. Really, I came up to this guy's hip that I'm standing next to. He fears him, but to me, he feared me. And I want to tell you that I love that. And now that might sound really sick and demented, But as a 14-year-old kid, I feared everything up until that moment. I feared my school. I feared home. I feared both my parents, my step-parents. I feared if I was going to have enough food to eat today. Now someone fears me. Bet. It's on. So they take me back to my cousin's house. They talk to me about shaving my head one night. I said, let's do it. Then they shave my head, and I'm now part of this group. And now I have to learn about things. All right, I got the black and white thing. All right, I I got that. Now they start talking about the Jews, right? And so when they start talking about the Jews, they start talking about the Federal Reserve, right? They start bringing, I'm 14 years old, they're talking to me about the Federal Reserve. I'm 37, I still don't know what the Federal Reserve does, you know, it's just always bad news. But when these guys start talking about the Federal Reserve and that it's secretly run by Israel and the Jews, 
What started happening to me was those things that I had always heard from the adults in my life, you know, the little stupid jokes. Hey, don't Jew me. Hey, how do you start a Jewish parade to roll a penny down the street? Ha, ha, ha. Well, that started to unlock. When these guys started talking about the Jews and money, I started to feel like an adult. I was getting the adult jokes. Like, ah, oh, now I get why my uncle said that. So just little things like that started to happen to me. And I, and I really started to get this. And I started to understand. And now I become part of this group that becomes a Christian identity skinhead group. We taught people how to hate at Bible studies up in the woods. We go up and we read the Bible. And I'm going to tell you some of the passages because it's crazy stuff. So the first story, Adam and Eve, right? Hey, God says, don't touch my apple. It's the only thing you can't have in my garden. Don't do it, chick. And she says, oh, I won't do it. And then she does it anyway, right? And she tricks the dude into doing it too, right? So anyway, that's the story we all heard. So and then they say, no, that's not what happened. The thing that happened was that the serpent man, the serpent that the devil sends up, this demon, he doesn't get her to have a piece of fruit. Come on, who can't? He gets her to have the forbidden fruit. He gets to have sex with her. And he impregnates her with Cain. And later on, after she has Cain, now she goes to Adam. And she, uh, she goes back, you know, to, with Adam. And, you know, she has her second son. So you have Cain and Abel. And now Cain is the first son born of the devil. Abel is born of Adam and Eve. And Cain later on kills Abel. And now what they would say is that Cain is actually from the devil, who is, he's the first original Jew. And they bring it back to this whole lineage of it. Now, when they would tell me this story, I'm like, what the heck? What? You know, like I can, and I remember, I, again, I made all my sacraments. <laughs> so I remember I would say to them, like, Sister Mary Agnes and Father Wassel never taught me this story <laughs> out of the Bible. And they say, God chose you to know it now. He's given you the truth now. And it's all about hate. Now, it's kind of weird and it's kind of crazy, but every religion has these groups in them. God allows for this to happen. He does. He says, you can be a jerk if you want. You want to read my book and be a jerk? It's how do you read it? Do you read the Bible with red colored glasses or do you read it with blue colored glasses? Do you read it with clear colored glasses or, you know, rainbow colored glasses? It's how you read it. It's how when I pick up the book, if I want to read the book, any of his books, and I will say, man, today I really, man, how can I prove that girl wrong today? And I will read it and I will find something about how to prove somebody wrong. But if I pick up the book and said, how can I be a better human being today? I read it a little differently, right? So I'm not reading to be a good human being. I'm not. I'm reading because I'm a fear-based, anger, egomaniac with no self-esteem. Most dangerous people in the world are them type of people. And that's what I was. So through all this, I become now, I'm told that it's okay to go out and cause Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm able to be an angel for God and I'm able to do things to gay people and anyone that is against my beliefs. And obviously with all this going on, I'm causing a lot of trouble and I get in juvenile detention centers, I'm throughout jail, and I wound up going out to Springfield, Illinois, through the underground system. And I come up in Springfield, and I'm running my own crew. When I run my own crew, I wound up kidnapping a guy, because that's how I deal with people, that's how I deal with my business. If you, I don't know how to have a conversation with somebody, so I will kidnap somebody. And I kidnap this guy, and I violently beat him on Christmas Eve to Christmas Day. And uh, Christmas Day, I let him go. And he went to the hospital due to some, some complications. And uh, the cops find out. Now, in this town of Springfield, Illinois, I am recruiting people on cable access. I had, like, this first, the second ever cable access show for the neo-Nazi movement. I was basically had, like, a Wayne's World, the racist Wayne's World going, right? It was, like, this funny show. And we, it was, we preached about things, but we made it funny. So the cops can't wait to get me. I'm um, obviously they know I'm not a local because I don't know if any of you know this, but on top of my head, because you can't see it right now, I have a tattoo. I really still have it. It's on top of my head. It says "Made in Philly," because that's where my parents, you know, that's where they had. So I was made in Philly. So, um, so anyway, whenever I would go commit crime and go move other places, they knew right away I'm not a local because it says it right on my head. Um, I had a big swastika tattooed on my neck right here. Not, not a pillar of our society. 
So when the police find out I kidnapped this guy, they arrest me and they put me in Sangamon County Jail. I'm 17 years old. They charged me as an adult. And now I remember, I'll tell you this story because I got to tell you, I got to give glory where glory is due to any God of any understanding. So I'm in solitary confinement because of my age. I'm the youngest kid in this county jail. It's a huge county jail. This isn't no Mayberry County Jail. This is like a huge penitentiary where they used to hold federal inmates and state inmates transferring. It's a, but it's the capital of Illinois, so it's a huge county jail, like 15 cell blocks, huge cell blocks. But I have a, a hole, and I'm in the hole because of my age. So I'm in there for a couple months, and I'm reading different books. I read the Book of Mormons. I read parts of the crime. And I remember I would get the Bible, and I would think, come on now, like... Everything I just learned, everything I've always learned out of the Bible was now bad. One, he's always going to punish me. Or two was, you know, I get to judge the world off this book. And so anyway, I said, you know what? I'm going to read the book anyway. I'm going to reread this on my own. So I'd hold the Bible shut. Here's what I used to do to God. I used to always test God. I say, God, if you're real, you'll kill all the guards right now, pop my door, knock down the walls, and let me go home. If you don't do it, dude, you're fake. You know? Nothing happened. I said, all right, I'm still going to read the book. And I dropped the book open, and whatever it opened up to, I would read. Whatever it opened up to that day. See, and I would read and read and read and read. And I would read until I fell asleep every night. And now, you always hear the joke, like, people find God, or you say, where do you find Jesus at? You find him in the county jail, that's where everyone else finds him, right? Well... When you have a public defender in your life, <laughs> you need God too, right? So I would read the Bible, and I got to read into the part about fasting. And I'd been in the hole for like three months. No human contact, none at all. So I would read this part, and it said in, the, in this passage, it says, you, know, you can fast, and God will reveal himself to you. Perfect, good, that's what I want. I want to get out of here. So I read, and then it says, but you cannot brag you cannot boast you're fasting for God. It's like praying on a street corner, basically. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm going to fast and go around and tell everyone God's my boy, right? So I start to fast, and the guards keep coming to me, and they slide my food through me, and I slide the food back out. I say, I, I ain't going to eat that. And they say, why aren't you eating? And I said, I can't tell you. Can't tell you why I'm not eating. So um, they take the food out, and they think I'm refusing to eat. They think I'm trying to kill myself. They think I'm on a hunger strike. So after the third day, the warden comes to me. It was on a Sunday. Warden comes into the prison, pulls me out of my cell. Now I got to remember, I'm like a high profile case, you know, kidnapping, skinhead, TV show. So they don't want people to think they're trying to harm me. So he pulls me out of my cell on Sunday, and he goes, Why aren't you eating? And I said, I can't tell you. But be prepared. <laughs> it's going to get pretty crappy around here in the next couple of days, you know. So, um, so he says, well, Mr. Mink, how about this? He goes, if you eat tomorrow, because I can't tell him. Again, I can't tell him. He says, if you eat tomorrow, I'll let you in general population. I don't think you belong in this cell block. And I'm telling you, I didn't answer the question. I, I didn't. I just remember it came from my gut. I was like, okay. Next day I ate, he put me on general pop. To this day, and, and I don't know if any of you don't know this yet, and I'm, I'm going to tell this to you, and I hope this doesn't offend you or make you think any different. I am not a Christian today. I'm not. But at that moment in my life right there, and to this day, that moment in my life proved to me that there's a God. God gave me what I needed, not what I wanted. And in that moment, to this day, is the only time whenever I, if I'm ever talking with someone who's an atheist, and I don't care if you're an atheist or not, I don't bother. But when we're talking, they say, how do you know there's God? I say, I know. I'm telling you, there's a moment in my life where this part of me said, this thing is real. And it was in that moment. Craziest thing, right? So God is in my life, and, and I'm finding higher power in everything and anything. But I'm still saying being a racist because that's kind of what my job is, I think. That's my job is to be a racist and a skinhead and this, into this race war that's eventually going to happen, and I'm going to defend the white race, and oh, I'm going to be glory, and oh, yeah. But I go end up in this in the upstate prison. My first prison they sent me to, one of the first prisons. I got shipped to one, and then I got shipped to another. But anyway, second prison I get sent to. Because I'm a bad guy, I'm a bad person, and I was. I was a bad human being. I was an egomaniac, low self-esteem with an alcohol problem. Dangerous, most dangerous human being, like I said earlier. They shipped me to the same prison with John Wayne Gacy. 
He's still alive at the time. Now he's dead. He's been, for those of you who don't know who John Wayne Gacy is, he's a dude that raped and killed. Now 34 days, found another body. 34 boys, 17, 18-year-old boys, raped and killed him and buried him all under his house in Chicago. And one of the, you know, world's worst serial killers. I'm in the same prison with the guy. And I remember getting off, the, I mean, it was one of those days, one of those funny things where I'm getting, I'm on the bus and I'm being transferred over and I'm thinking, you know, I'm really not that bad a guy. Like I'm thinking to myself, like Frank, you're, you know, you, you got some bad qualities, but you're, you're okay. In the inner core, you're okay. And I remember getting off the bus and all that went away. I was like, nobody else thinks I'm okay on the inside. Like nobody thinks that about me and they shouldn't. I didn't ever express it. Well, go up into this new prison called Shawnee, and when I get up to Shawnee, I start to play a lot of sports. Now, the Aryans respect me. I'm, I'm, I'm a respected member of our Aryan community. I had a TV show about being a neo-Nazi. I didn't join the gang just because I got into prison and realized I'm outnumbered by black guys from Chicago, so I better join a gang. I was already involved in this stuff, and I knew all the literature. So I'm very respected, and, and so we're out one day in the yard, and we're all talking, and, and the day I got sent up to this new prison, I cut my hair back, so that Made in Philly is showing. Well, in prison, we have men who dress like women all day long. That's just how they live their lives, or whatever, you know? So anyway, they call them the queens. Well, the queen is walking down past me. She's a big black queen, and we're walking up the steps, and I'm walking up, she's walking down. So she looks down on me, and she says, what's that say on your head? And I said, oh, it says, it says made in Philly. I'm from South Philly. She goes, I'm from South Chicago. I said, what a coincidence that is. That's great for you, you know? And I kept on walking on. And this is, I walked on. Rude, very rude. Get out of here. So that day, I'm out with all the Aryans. We're standing on this thing, and here comes that queen. And now the head Aryan is introducing me to all the guys. Hey, this is the skinhead with the TV show, blah, blah, blah. And everyone says, oh, it's so nice that you're here. No, it's not, but that's okay. That's cool. And um, so as these, uh, I hear people on the walk track behind us, which there's a fence. So I have my back to the fence. And I hear behind the fence, I hear, hey, skinhead. And so I turn, and it's that queen. And she's walking with another queen. And she goes really loud, hey. She taps her friend. Hey, I told you he's cute. And I was like, oh, man. Now I have my back to all my Aryan boys, and I'm looking at this guy. And I'm thinking, you son of a gun. He, he got me. He got me good on this one. So he kept on walking. And he was getting me for being, I was rude to him, so he's being rude to me. Well, I turn back around, and here's the funny, these Aryan guys are all sitting there, and this one guy chimes up real loud. He goes, how about that, Frank, huh? When the master race takes over, he's getting shot twice. He's black, and he's gay. Now, I'd like to go over this real quick, just for any of you that ever dabbled or know anyone that's dabbling in this world of, you know, racist groups, racism, anti-Semitic. The words when they say, when the master race takes over, you hear it all the time in the movement. And it's never anything, it's always when the master race takes over, blah, 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 blah. It's never anything good. It's never when the master race takes over, we're going to go around and plant petunias and let baby bunnies flock around. No, it's always really bad, bad stuff. So when he says the master race takes over, he's getting shot twice, he's black, and he's gay, that snapped me back out of being embarrassed because I was just embarrassed about the situation that just happened to me, about this guy calling me cute in the joint, and I'm blushing, and when I blush, I, I tear. I'm a horrible blusher. So that snaps me back too, and I turned to the guys, and I said, no, guys, that's good. And all of them like, oh, we don't, man, I don't know if we're like on the East Coast, but we ain't down with the gay stuff in here. And I said, no, guys, if he's black and he's gay, he's not going to reproduce his race. Get it? He's not going to be with a woman because he's only going to be with another man. And it took them all a minute. <laughs> That's deep. You know, that was some deep, <laughs> deep stuff right there. And that is a true story. From that day on, I was the intelligent racist. So... Um, they're like, now we know why you had a TV show. That's deep. Um, so look, uh, I came up in the prison system with this kid named G. 
and um, G was in the county jail with me, and then he was in Shawnee when I got up, and G was this little black kid, and he was from Chicago area. Super funny guy. When in county jail, well, he would mock everybody. He just, he was one of those guys I wanted, when after I got to general population, I always wanted to be around because he always made me laugh because we're not really set in the gangs at the time in the county jail because we're waiting to get transferred up to our gangs and the big prisons. So we'd always kind of sit around. We were the youngest two kids in a prison. We'd always joke about being the youngest kids in a prison, whatever. Someday, one day, he was going to go play football. So I said, yo, let me go play football with you guys. It was all the black dudes. And he was like, nah, you know, because we usually stay separated, but sometimes we don't. It matters what the day is. You know, sometimes there's neutral days. Sometimes there's not neutral days. This day is a neutral day. There's a neutral yard. Anyone can go play in that yard. So I'm like, let me play. I'd already played football and basketball with the bikers and the Aryans. And when you play basketball with the Aryans, you let double dribbling go. You let traveling go. It's just, they don't know how to play the game. And I know how to play. Grew up my whole life playing sports. Football, they don't know how to, they can change their transmission, but they do not know how to cradle a football. You know, I knew how to go up and pop it behind them. Sucked. So when I went to go play with the black kids and the black guys, I walked up, they said, oh, you don't really want to play with us, but, you know, white boy. I said, yes, I do. And they said, okay, well, you can do kickoff returns, knowing that nobody's going to block for me. And I'm going to get that first kickoff return, get my head ripped off, and I'll quit like they've probably done to every other white boy that ever swore he was good. So the first kickoff return comes to me, and what happens is I start to stutter step. Now, again, I played Pop Warner, all that. I know football. So I cradle the football, and I could see that there's a lot of what the missed assignments. <laughs> there's a lot of missed blocking going on at this time. And so they're all running top speed at me, and nobody's blocking, which works to my advantage because now I just have to get past one line of defense. I just have to break that one hole. So I stutter step, stutter step, boom, hit the hole with the spin move, r rotate the ball as I do it to keep it away from the, the defender, and as I hit that hole, I'm gone. I'm just gone. You're not catching me. I'm unbelievably fast, and when I'm scared, <laughs> I'm a hundred times faster than I was. <laughs> you know, so I'm gone, and they're talking about killing me and raping me when they catch me. So I get to the end zone, and as I'm running, though, this other black kid on my team is running next to me, and I'm waiting. He's just yelling at me. He's yelling, run, white boy, run, white boy. And I'm like, block. Turn around and block. So as we keep running, I get to the end zone. I want to act like I've been there before. You don't celebrate. You, you, act, you, know, you act appropriate. So you know, I put the ball down. That's what's up. And that black kid now catches up to me, stops, and puts his finger right in my face. And I'm waiting for him to say, yo, good job, white boy. The only thing he did was, boy, you run scared. And I just looked at him. I said, I am. I am scared. They're going to kill me. I said, that's why they're not going to catch me all game. So he goes and tells the other black kid, Joe, white boy says they ain't going to catch him all game. So they make me a wide receiver. Now everyone in prison ball is a wide receiver. Even the blockers can go out for passes if you want. So it's just one quarterback and 15 wide receivers. But they make me a wide receiver. Being the token white kid, uh, whenever he, our quarterback would scramble, he would beam the ball to me because he knew that I would go get it. I was like a dog with a ball. He would throw it to the post, and I'd go get it to the post. I mean, you just throw the ball, and I'm like a dog. <laughs> a ball, a ball, a ball, right? And that's how I am. It's exactly how I am. So funny thing is, um, <laughs> the black guy stopped calling me skinhead. They stopped calling me Aryan. They didn't even call me Frank anymore. You know what they call me? Steve. That was my name, and it stuck. Steve. Why? Steve Largent. All the black guys thought of me, and for those of you too young to remember, Steve Largent was like the Wes Welker back in the day. He was this little white wide receiver to play for the Seattle Seahawks. Got killed all the time playing, but would just get right back up. So all the black guys just called me Steve, and I just said, well, it's better than them calling me bad names or skinhead or whatever, so I just adopted the name Steve. Um, look, I get released from prison, and I gotta get through some of this, but there's things that are just starting to happen in my life. I get out, and I'm just going to be a dad. And when I'm going to be a dad, I, I, when I was in prison, I had, a, I had a daughter while I was in prison. So I get to get out, and I get to try and be a dad to her. And it's not working because I still quack and walk like a duck. So I'm a duck. I'm not a good human being yet. It's not happening. So the mother takes her from my life in, in Illinois and says, you know what, you don't deserve to see her. And she was absolutely right. I was not a good role model, not a good example of a father. So I'm 19 years old, just getting out of the penitentiary. I go back to Philadelphia. When I get back to Philly, uh, I'm hanging out with skinhead crews that I used to run, and I'm kind of like now like a legend. I went to prison. I was kidnapped by one of our rivals in the skinhead movement, whatever. Um, 
I'm on the train. I'm on the L train going to the Frankfurt station. And as I'm on the train, this black dude sits next to me. And I'm going to go meet up with all my skinhead boys. And as we're all going to go meet up. So anyway, this black dude sits next to me. And me and him start rapping about his life. He just he knows I'm in a skinhead. He sees it, but he doesn't care. He sits down. He says, hey, you ever done time before? I looked at him. I said, no, we're both on the L. I said, yeah, man, I did time out in Illinois. He's like, oh, I did time here in Greater for it, right? So we start swapping prison stories. We're talking about what people, men do in their rectums to hide things. It's craziest story, right? I mean, it's prison, so, don't, you know, people would hide things, g- drugs, whatever. So we're going, and we're always, like, one up in each other. I'd be like, well, one time my boy did this, this, and this, you know, and I'm just making it up by now. And he, and he would one up me. My boy would do blah, blah, a license plate. What? A license plate? You know what I mean? Like, are you kidding me? So... Um, but we're laughing about it, and we're joking, right? And anyone that was normal sitting next to us moved, right? So we're just laughing real loud and joking with each other. And he gets off, and, and he kind of reminded me of G a little bit. And G was my boy, right? So he gets off the train, and he's like, yo, it gives me a pound. He goes, yo, man, it's real down to earth talking with you, man. Thanks, brother. I said, yeah, real down to earth with you too, right? And he gets off. That was the word, real down to earth. He gets off. I got to go meet up with all my skin boys. I'm sitting around, and, and things just aren't gelling. Right? And then there was these uh, skinheads from New York that come down to try and get this alliance back with us because we had the bigger, better crew. So the New York guys came down to hang out with us. So as they're down with us, this one guy's getting all drunk and he starts talking about how Italians aren't white. Now this has gone on rapidly in the movement for years that Italians are not white. Probably is correct for those people. I hope that don't offend you, but it's too bad. It's the truth. And it, it prove that point that Italians are not white. The city of Venice is built in the middle of the ocean, right? It's built in the middle of the ocean because the Italians were constantly being taken over by other races of people and other religions, and the matings was happening. So the Italians said, you know what, man, we're tired of being taken over. We're going to go build a town out in the ocean, and if they want to come get us, they're going to get their butts out in the ocean to come get us, right? So that's why Venice was built. So it's a true story that Italy was taken over so many times that we might not be white, then that's okay. But when this guy says it in the meeting, at the time, that still offended me. So this guy from New York says Italians aren't white. I got about punch him in his mouth because that's how I handle my business. And I punch him in the mouth, and he was a big guy, right? But he was a big baby Yui guy, right? And he was like, you know, remember that skit, fat guy in a little coat? Well, this was that guy. But he was like in a little apartment, so he couldn't move. So when I hit him, he couldn't hit me back because he couldn't turn his arms, right? So when I hit him, we fall, and I'm on top of him. Thank God I'm on top of him. So I'm on top of him, and my boys all break it up, and they kick me out. And I remember at that moment thinking, my boys wouldn't stand up for me. But I had been drinking that night, and so I'm having a conversation again with God. I'm having a conversation with God. Now, he's not talking back to me. I'm not that drunk yet, but I've been there in my life, being from Second Street, where I've had God talk back to me. So um, I'm drinking, and, and I just said, you know what, God, on the Asian, Latino, black thing, I got this. We're all equal. I got it. There was a thing going on at the time, and just to p- prove some of the history of where this comes from, at the same time was the O.J. Simpson trial going on in my life, in all of our lives. I'm starting to hear about DNA. Scientifically, I've been told that in the movement, scientifically and religiously, biblically, that we are completely separated from each other. And now this real DNA, this real science is saying, no, we're all exactly the same. That's crazy crap. So I I can accept that, but I'm still going to hate the Jews. See, because the Jews, I don't know any Jews. See, and that's the easiest way. And it's what we kind of all do this, not hate Jews. That's a horrible thing to say. Um, But we all do something. We all... First thing that we do, say you're going to walk into a room and your friends are playing Monopoly and you don't know how to play Monopoly. What's the first thing you say when they say, hey, come play Monopoly? You say, no, that game is stupid. I hate that game. And you're stupid for playing it, right? We all do that subconsciously because we don't want to say, hey, I don't know how to play the game you play. Girls I've dated throughout my whole life and throughout the world, the girls I've dated, I say, hey, come watch the Philadelphia Flyers with me. Come watch hockey. And they say, hockey? I hate that game. And I say, get out. Right now, get out of my life. You hate hockey because you do not understand it. You do not know what icing is. You do not know what offsides is. If you knew these things, you know this is the greatest game on earth. Fact, by the way. <laughs> so a buddy of mine comes to me. I, again, I have a big swastika on my neck, and I'm trying not to go over on time here, guys. I'm so sorry if I am. But listen, I have a big swastika on my neck. I have skinhead written on my knuckles. I have an aggravated kidnapping on my record at the age of 17 years old. And now I'm 19. When I go to fill out job applications, these are not good people skills. 
Nobody wants this guy. So a buddy of mine says he can get me a job in a Cherry Hill, New Jersey mall, working at an antique sh show, carrying in and out antique furniture. They just have antique furniture show in the, in the hallways of the old Cherry, of the Cherry Hill mall. So anyway, I say, you know what? The guy says, I'll give you $100 a day. I said, man, I'll take the job. I don't care. I'll take it. Let's do it. So he goes, but I got to tell you, the dude that owns the company is Jewish. He still wants the job. And I was like, man, you know, I need the money. I'll take the job. I don't have to talk to the guy, do I? And he goes, no, Keith said the same thing about you. I told him, I know this neo-Nazi guy that needs a job. He said, he doesn't care what you believe. Just don't break his furniture. So I show up. I work for this guy. And Keith was that Upper East Coast Jewish guy, you know. He didn't wear a yarmulke or anything, but he's like, ugh, oy vey, ooh, you know, like just Jewishy, you know. So I go to go work for him. And after a whole week, the weekend goes by, I get $600 in tips alone. You know, people like their antiques on the East Coast. So people will give us tips. Well, I'm thinking, you ever, you know what, let me just point this out that we're all human again. But here's the other thing that we all do. Do you ever do this? Like, you're like, you know what, today when I see Maurice, I, that's it, I'm done. I'm telling Maurice off today. Like, that, you know, I just, he's going to say this. I know it because he always says it. And then I'm going to say this. And then I'm going to trump his butt with this. And then he's going to try and come back at me with this. And then we're going to have this conversation. And I'm, but by the end of the thing, he's going to be crying because I'm done with Maurice. Wait until I see him today. Oh, I can't wait. And then you see Maurice and you're like, what's up, Maurice? And Maurice like, yeah, what's going on? And you're like, nothing, man, what's going on? Right? We all plan that conversation, that big argument, and it consumes our whole day. It probably consumes your whole morning when you see Maurice, it's gonna happen. And then you see Maurice and it don't even happen. So I did the same thing with Keith. I was like, you know, in this anti-Semitic way, he's going to Jew me. He's not gonna give me my $300 he owes me. He's going to say, you made $600 in tips. You're lucky I don't take $300 back from you. <laughs> And when I see him, he comes up and he's starting to pay some people and he's talking and I was waiting for him, you know, and he's like, comes up to me, he's like, hey, Frank, I said, and he goes, I owe you some money. I said, yep, that's right, $300. Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, that's right, 300 right, yeah. He goes, here you go, here's one, here's two, here's 300 He goes, you know what, here's an extra 100 bucks. You're a really good worker. And I said, you son of a gun. <laughs> you ruined it. <laughs> Gave me a ride back from Cherry Hill in the Philly, and in that ride back, he asked me what type of work do I do, and I said, I do nothing because I have a swastika on my neck. <laughs> I have no career options here. And he goes, well, why don't you come work for me? So I go and I go work for this Jewish guy. Again, not religiously Jewish, just definitely East Coast, Upper East Coast, just Jewish guy. And um, I would be in a truck a lot with him. We'd drive up and down the Jersey Turnpike, you know, getting furniture to get refinished to put into his stores. We had a store in the Cherry Hill Mall. Um, we had stores in a couple different malls here and there called Keith's Antiques. And so I would work for this guy, and we would go get the furniture, and we had all these guys in the warehouse that would finish and unfin refinish and fix the furniture. And a lot of times I'm in a truck with them. See, and I used to do this thing, and you'll hear this from, from other kids that are like me, that are, that are tough kids that maybe had tough home lives. or uh, I'm an egomaniac of low self-esteem. So when I break something, and when you, these kids break something, you'll always hear this, oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, that's so stupid. You're stupid. Everyone's stupid. It's so stupid. I'm so dumb. I used to say that all the time. I don't know why. I just did it. Anytime I made a mistake, instead of owning up to the mistake, I'd say, oh, I'm so stupid. Like, it's so expected of me. I'm so stupid. So one day I broke something, and that's what Keith didn't like. So I break something, and I was like, oh, my God, Keith, I'm so stupid. And he came over to me. And he was kind of a stocky old dude. I'll never, he gripped me by the back of my neck like this, you know, like that. He goes, stop saying you're stupid, you idiot. Let's go. And he grabbed me, and he's like, let's go. And I was like, all right. And I grabbed the broken piece of this marble and threw it in the back of our truck. And he'd already paid for it, so he couldn't get his money back. And I get in the truck, and as I get in the truck, like, I'm just kind of quiet and watching the road and, you know, Jersey Turnpike. Garden State my butt, you know what I mean? So I'm just looking at the Jersey Turnpike. And he just unloads on me. He's like, you're one of the most smartest people I've ever met. You are so street smart. You can't pay. I couldn't pay someone to come out of a college what you got in that brain right there, Frank. And as he's doing this, I'm still a neo-Nazi, guys. I'm still shaving my head, still hanging every other couple days with some Nazi dudes doing my thing. And that day, I had my Doc Martens on, my red laces, with man, I was a neo-Nazi. And this dude is just sitting there and he's just like, man, you're one of the most smartest people I've ever met. And I actually secretly believe that about him. 
because he's a street smart guy who made this business out of nothing. So this whole time I kind of envy him a little bit. And now he's telling me I'm the most smartest person he's ever met. He's like, I hate when you say you're stupid. He's like, you're one of the most people that should never say they're stupid. And I'm sitting in this truck with Keith, and Keith is the guy where I could be like, yo, Keith, I want to be an astronaut tomorrow. He'd be like, Frank, you could do it. If anyone could be an astronaut, Frank, it could be you, dude. Let's go to the moon. You know, like he just was always saying that type of stuff to me. And he wasn't trying to change me. Keith is a Philly guy. He doesn't care. As long as I work good and I had good conversation, he wasn't trying to change me. And that's what was working. He was just a human being to me. So when we're driving, oh, I keep looking over at this guy. I had my Doc, like I said, I had my Doc Martens on with my red laces, which doesn't mean we're all racist, you know, but I couldn't put my Doc Martens underneath that seat any further. Like, he didn't know. Like, you know, now all of a sudden he doesn't know what that means. But I was, like, so embarrassed. Like, this was my final breaking point. Like, I'm so embarrassed of my beliefs. This swastika has been looking at this guy for six months because we're in a truck, and I'm always a passenger, he's always a driver. It's right there every day, a big swastika right in his face. And he treated me with nothing but love and kindness and empathy. And so I am just keep looking over at him, and I'm just... It isn't like one of the moments where I didn't want this guy to be my dad. I was just grateful to have this human being in my life all the time. Truly grateful for it. So um, he dropped me off that day, and that was it, you know? That was my day. That was the day I'm like, all right, I'm done. Some people come to me a lot, and they always say, well, how would you really change? Because people, a lot of people, some people change, like, in interrogation rooms, you know, when the FBI are in front. I'm like, wait, never mind, I'm not a racist no more, I'm cool. Like, let me out, I'm done, I'm done with this. It was all fun and games for a little while, now you're going to get all serious on me. Um, I didn't do that. I mean, I just didn't. It was a God of my understanding, science, and human nature. These three things, and I could pinpoint them all throughout my life where these things kept tripping me up. And I got plenty of people in my life. This dude, Abel, I'll never forget this big black dude in my county jail was just this great soul of a human being. I knew that he had God in his life, you know. I knew that God did not separate us. So then I started to study all this. And I just started to study race. And, and we're just about over on time here, so I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. So I'm going to put it to this. Um, you know, we are all exactly the same. And there are some small things that are different. Diabetes is more prevalent in different communities. Sickle cell anemia, which is actually a Mediterranean disease, not really a black disease. But anyway, it's details. Who needs details? Um, so there are little inklings of things. But what's the same as, like, our women? Women are the most amazing, craziest things ever put on this earth. You know what I mean? If you take uh, different women, you know... It's true. I, I think you should run the world, honestly. I think the world would be a lot better place if women ran the world. So, um, you know, if you put women together and they have their moon time, as the Native Americans would say, and you put them all together, no matter what race, color, creed, they start to have it at the same time. Do you know that? That's true. That's a true, story. That's a true scientific thing that that happens together. Because they put off pheromones, which are like these crazy drugs that go out into the world and make men do crazy things. But they also make other women do crazy things. It makes them have their moon time at the same time. Are you kidding me? We are human beings on this rock that goes around the sun. So I will end the story with this. And take this as you want. Take it how you will. But here's the truth. In Africa, where we all come from, by the way, in Africa, they went, and, they, and this is like in the 50s and the 60s, they built a new animal reserve, like Tinicum. You guys remember Tinicum? Anybody else that next day? Anyway, they don't have elephants there. But anyway, so they had this animal reserve, and they go and they get all these elephants from different herds, all these baby elephants, and they figure they'll come together as they grow and they become their own herd. They want to set a new herd of elephants in this animal reserve. So they get all these baby elephants, and they put them all together and let them grow and grow and grow, and these baby elephants start killing things. They start, like, raping rhinos. I mean, they are crazy elephants right? They're going around chasing humans, uprooting trees, being crazy. So these Dutch people come in and they start shooting. There was like 150 elephants and they start shooting all these elephants because they're like, what are we going to do? These things are crazy. These are crazy elephants. What do we do? So they're doing all this and then this old African man comes to them and he says, stop shooting these elephants. And you did this to them. Stop shooting them. And he said, well, what do we do? He said, go get the old elephants from the other tribes. Go get the big old elephants and bring them in here. They'll smack the crap out of these little elephants. Teach them how to act like elephants. They don't know how to act like elephants. 
And now that you've heard my story, and I'm sure you all have your own story, it is time for all of us in this room to walk and be an old elephant in our community, in our families, and with our younger people. So when you hear someone say a racist joke, do not laugh. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some funny comedians who say racial things that I find completely funny. Lisa Lamp, Ben Ali, I mean, you can name all these comedians. I die when, but they're comedians. But when you're sitting around and I hear someone say a stupid racist joke, I cannot laugh at it because laughing at that racist joke of how do you starve a black person, you put his welfare check in his work boots, and you laugh at that, you now have accepted that as a true fact by laughing. Laughter is acceptance of a racist joke. And then, and this is to be the old elephant, to stand up to the older elephant, I always hear this from people. I always hear them, they'll say something really racist. You ever with somebody and they just say something really racist? You're like, what the hell? Where did you, why would you say that? You know, and they say, oh, my grandfather always says it, and he's, he's old school. I say, your grandpa's not old school, your grandpa's a racist. <laughs> old school is Smokey Robinson, that's old school. You know what I mean? Marvelous Marvin Hagger. That's old school. You know, that's old school. That's a racist comment. And I promise you that God loves all of us equally, no matter what race, color, creed. That's why if you ever go into recovery rooms, you'll find people of all race, colors, and creed. God has given everyone that option to get sober from one of the drugs. Excuse me, we're going to end it right now. One of the drugs that completely equalifies all of us, and that is addiction. Alcoholism and addiction completely knocks us all off our pegs. But we'll also all find it mostly through a spiritual foundation of a religion, 12-step programs. It's mostly a way for me to reconnect with God. So when I pray today and when I did this morning, I say the same prayer. I meditate to this aura that connects us all. That's what I pray to. No certain thing. This says aura connects us all. And then I say God, because I call him God because I don't know what else to call him. I don't, the thing never, or it never told me its name, and if it did, I might be in a mental institution. Um, but I say, God, please allow me to be among the sharper tools in your shed. And if you need me for work, I'm ready and available for whatever you want me to do. Peace out. I'm done meditating. Thank you guys for having me here. I don't know how to follow up with that. <laughs> um, so we're going to close the service with a couple ways. We're going to close with the song, Hallelujah. The buckets will be coming around for first-time attenders. We don't expect you for gift. For those of you who are members of New Church Live, we expect you to gift a lot. <laughs> those will be coming around. If, you, if you're interested, folks, like, like, like let's, let's speak to what the world can be. You know, love is not, as the song says, love is not a victory march. It's a cold and a broken hallelujah. You know, and maybe let's live into that world a bit. So we're going to have a song. Buckets are going to come around. I'm going to come back out with Frank. We're going to close with a prayer and then send you on your way with the last song. Take care. I'd ask you now to please join Frank and I in prayer. So, Lord, you know, we're thinking today uh, about beloved community, about what reconciliation can look like, Lord, about what hallelujah can look like. Hallelujah, that's not just a word on our lips, but that is, that is a spirit we, we lean into, a spirit of love and compassion and connection. A spirit that's willing to reach out and ask someone how their day is, a spirit that's willing to reach out and remind the idiots in our life they're not that stupid. Lord, you know, just, just thank you for Frank's presence here among us today. Lord, allow it to stir into our hearts what we can create. What we're trying to create this afternoon after church, we're trying to create in this world, what we're trying to create in the world which you've called us to just be as best we can part of your very healing presence in a world that so needs it. Stir it, stir it in our hearts, Lord. A, a world of, of, of pain and anger and, and violence. And Lord, help us to just stand in a different way. 
Help us to just maybe in some way, Lord, find that way home, to find that call, to find that peace, to find our place in this life and on this journey. Lord, and I'm sure on behalf of everyone here, we ask that you just pour your blessing into Frank's life. Help him, Lord, to just carry this message forward, a message that that so many need to hear. We need to hear over and over again. Allow us, Lord, to live this life fully, completely, with love, with compassion over our time here. In your name we pray, with gratitude, with joy, with strength, Lord, maybe to make a step. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.